So I'm a pollster. I uh, want to understand Canadians through the perspective of survey research, those phone calls you get on your cell phones and on your landlines and so on. Um, wanting to understand how we're changing as a people over time and how we're changing in comparison uh, with other countries. Books I've written. Um, Sex in the Snow was not about the weather, uh, and nor was it an autobiography, actually. <laughs> My girlfriends in high school who I invited to the book launch said, Michael, you were interesting, but you were not that interesting. So, some people will never impress. Better Happy Than Rich, uh, Fire and Ice about Canada and the United States, The Myth of Converging Values, Unlikely Utopia was a book 10 years ago about how we were changing in terms of ethnicity and immigration and uh, visible minorities and so on. Uh, Staying Alive was about my fellow baby boomers and how we were just entering the second half of our adult lives as we were becoming age 65. Uh, committing Sociology, that was in honor of Prime Minister Harper said anybody who wants to explain why people would do what they're doing is committing sociology. I think it's a crime. It's going to be maybe in the criminal code someday. Um, and then could it happen here? Canada is no stranger to the xenophobia. Um, we, of course, have had the long assault on indigenous people since the 1600s. Uh, poor treatment of Irish immigrants coming over from the potato famine racist immigration policies up to about 18, uh, 1967, anti-Semitism turning away uh, to St. Louis uh, with a boatload of Jewish people who were fleeing Nazi Europe in the 1930s. The, rest, the official response was, none is too many, which will live in infamy and Canadian uh, pronouncements <coughs> on uh, attitudes to others who are at our shores. Uh, the internment of Japanese Canadians during the uh, 1940s and more recently the profiling, the police profiling of racialized minorities. And racist policies reflected public opinion at the time. This is 1946, so we've just gone through the Second World War. My dad served in the Second War in the Navy. Um, and Gallup had come to Canada and was doing polling for newspapers like the Toronto Star and the Montreal Star and so on. Can you imagine after the Second World War of our fighting Nazi Germany and uh, Japan and so on, that a poll would ask Canadians, uh, if Canada does allow more immigration, are there any groups of nationalities that you would like to keep out? And 60% of Canadians saying, keep out Japanese. The Jewish people, 49. It had, I guess, at that time, we really were unaware of the Holocaust. Uh, we soon would become aware. Keep out Germans, Russians. The word Negro was the phrase that Gallup pollsters used in 1946. Italians and Chinese. These are very, very large numbers that are shocking in today's context. But jump ahead even to 1960, uh, Gallup poses a question. As you know, Canada restricts the admin admission of non-whites to this country. Do you think this should continue? Do you think there should be fewer restrictions on uh, or fewer restrictions on non-whites? 53% of majority of Canadians in 1960 say a continuing restriction on non-whites coming to Canada. Should be fewer restrictions, 36, qualified 11 percent. So this is only yesterday. Something happened in the 1960s. Um, I think it starts with the Quiet Revolution in Quebec, where the Quebecers are demanding to be treated as equals and not second-class citizens in Canada. Uh, 1967, we changed that racist immigration policy to a point system based on your, uh, the job skills you bring to Canada, uh, your ability to speak some English or French, um, and your educational uh, accomplishments, uh, we started allowing people in from around the world. 
and people from around the world came to Canada. In 1971, we invented the concept of multiculturalism. This happened because we appointed the Royal Commission of Bilingualism and Biculturalism in the mid-1960s in response to Quebec, uh, uh, rising Quebec Quiet Revolution. Um, and the By and By Commission, some actually it was Poles, Ukrainians saying we aren't just um, English and French in this country, there's your Poles, Ukrainians, and lots of others, and so we switched from biculturalism to to multiculturalism, it is one of those uh, Canadian terms that is a gift to the world, just like the private sponsorship of refugees that came somewhat later. And later we uh, passed the Multicultural Act uh, during the government of Brian Mulroney in 1988. In the late 1970s, both liberal and conservative governments, uh, in response to the crisis in the Far East, welcomed 60,000 boat people, people from Vietnam and Cambodia and other countries, uh, to Canada. And we came up with this private sponsorship of refugees, in which ordinary citizens could get together, raise some money, and sponsor a family, church groups, neighborhood groups, and so on, uh, to do that. Uh, and, and again, another unique Canadian contribution to, to uh, social change and progress. In 2015, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission releases its report and its 94 uh, calls to action. In 2015 and 2016, Canada, in the spirit of welcoming the boat people in the 1970s, welcomed 40,000 Syrian refugees, uh, inspired in part by that tragic picture of Alan Kurdi, who washed up on the shores of, uh, of Turkey. So do average Canadians uh, support immigration and the ideology of multiculturalism? <coughs> well, in recent decades, there has been a sea change in attitudes and public opinion in the country. So this is from the Enveronics Focus Canada series, surveys of 2,000 representative samples of Canadians. Uh, that we've conducted since the late 1970s. And this is an item where we say, do you agree or disagree, uh, that immigration levels are too high. So we actually make the statement, do you agree or disagree, immigration levels are too high. And you can see for the period from uh, the late 1970s uh, 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 right through to the mid-1990s, the majority of Canadians did think immigration levels were too high. And then in the mid-90s, something changed. Our attitudes changed, and we see a reversal, a sea change in public opinion. And now we can see that since the late 1990s, and right up to, and this last number, 63%, was taken in the last two weeks of this last federal election campaign, 63% of people disagree and say to our respondents, no, immigration levels are not too high, but we still have a third of people who do think immigration levels are too high. But kind of a two to one nation, two, two, you know, two, for every one person who's against uh, uh, more immigration, you get two people who are in favor of more immigration. Canadians are also a lot less likely to oppose immigration from racial minority groups. And you can see we've asked this in 1990, 91, 92, 93, and then we stopped asking the question, but we did pose it in 219. And now we have 64% of people who are disagreeing that we accept too many immigrants from racial minority groups, but 29% of people do think that. The vast majority of Canadians continue to believe that the economic impact of immigrants is positive. They're not coming here to get on welfare. They're coming here to get a job and to work and to contribute to Canada. 80% in our most recent survey is showing that the economic impact of immigrants is positive. And only 16% of people think that the economic impact is negative. We're less likely than before to believe that many refugees are not legitimate. You can see this polling has been going on since 1987. And we're now equally divided on the issue of whether or not many refugee claimants are not legitimate. 43% uh, uh, disagree that they're not legitimate, and 
39% do agree with the statement that many are not legitimate claimants. But again, you can see that over time, progressive open attitudes are increasingly becoming uh, the norm in Canada. What makes Canada unique? So this is a question that we've asked a representative sample of Canadians uh, for a number of years. And, um, and in 2016, it's an open-ended question, so people can give any answer they want. And off the top, they don't tell us it's the Mounties. They don't even say hockey. <laughs> they say that what Canada has become is a, a petri dish for bringing humanity to a place and having them get along with each other, empathize with what it's like to be someone else, and to find common ground. So multiculturalism and diversity, 43%. It's across the country. And by the way, it's just as strong in Quebec as it is in other provinces. This may lead you to ask me a question if we have a Q&A period. The land and geography comes second. Freedom, uh, friendly, humble people. I don't know, they haven't met anybody in Toronto that I know. Um, <laughs> Uh, the people, the weather, and the cold climate, for sure. Uh, peace, uh, peace, peacekeeping, and uh, uh, peacefulness. Natural resources, universal health care, uh, the political system, tolerance, and our values. So that's very interesting. Is that the, you know, the, the, the stereotype is that we're all about Moose Mountains and Mounties, and in fact, what we are is a massive socio-cultural experiment. Oh, bilingualism, Aboriginal peoples, hockey at 1%, uh, the North, other, etc. As for immigrants, the vast majority identify more with Canada than their country of birth. I found this research kind of astounding. Because um, Canadian abroad, Canadians abroad, when they're surveyed, whatever country they go to, they identify much more with Canada than the country they go to. And this is particularly true for Canadians in the United States, and probably particularly in the last three years. But Canadians abroad bra uh, brag about being uh, Canadian. But immigrants come to our country, and they, when we survey them, the 8 and 10 say they identify more with Canada than their home country, 12%, which I would have thought would have been a much larger number, identify more. Uh, I mean, a 7% identify more with their country of birth as, as 12% and both equally uh, 9%. This is fascinating. This is asking uh, the broad cross-section of Canadians and immigrants, what are the most important values for immigrants to adopt when they come to Canada? Now, you get some people saying, oh, they want us to become them. That is a ridiculous idea, and there is absolutely no feeling at all that immigrants are going to come here and make us into them. Respect for Canada's history and culture. So 27% of, of, uh, of all Canadians think that respect for our history and culture is what an immigrant should, uh, should learn when they adapt to when they come to Canada. But immigrants agree that that's what they should do. <clears throat> Learn English or French. You've got to get a job. You've got to be able to speak in one of the official languages. Tolerance for others, equally shared by immigrants and native-born Canadians. Respect for the law. Need to assimilate. Embrace democracy and freedom. Respect for other re uh, religions. Uh, the work ethic. Be employed, actually, even more so by immigrants than uh, by native Canadians. So this, to me, is quite astounding that I guess uh, when we hand them that citizenship guide, they pour over the thing <laughs> and uh, read about what it is to, what they know what country they're coming to. They're not going to the U.S. or France or, or Britain. They're coming to Canada. However, the majority, though a declining proportion of Canadians believe that too many immigrants do not adopt Canadian values. Now, it used to be 72% thinking immigrants don't adopt Canadian values. That's down to half. And I think, and, and this is a little bit what's going on in Quebec, is that there is a sense that immigrants 
who often come from countries where they are more religious than Canadians have become over the last 60 years, are not adopting the secularism that has become the secular religion of Canada quickly enough. And, and then we'll maybe talk about this a little bit later, but I think it's part of that is what's behind Bill 21 in Quebec. Part of it, I think, is not only are immigrants coming from countries that might be more religious than Canada is today, but they're also coming from more traditional societies in which patriarchy, the father is the master of the house, and sexism are more uh, values in the country that people come from. And people are concerned that immigrants are not quickly enough adopting the value of gender equality which in the last 50 or 60 years has become a core value in Canada. Uh, having, uh, having been quite patriarchal in the 50s and prior to that, uh, gender equality now is seen as a core Canadian value. We put it in the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and so on. And, uh, and I think that is uh, 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 part of the reason why uh, you get this Bill 21 and so on. From an international perspective, Canada ranks first out of 25 countries in a recent overall inclusiveness index uh, and are among the most likely globally to view immigrants as a strength rather than a, than a burden. And you can see again how uh, Canada comes out, uh, what, 68% thinking immigrants are a strength for Canada, not a burden. And well ahead of other countries, and of course, including uh, the United States. Our recent history, we shouldn't forget, the early Reform Party uh, uh, tapped into Eastern establishment's progressive liberalism by giving voice to opposition to the relentless efforts to accommodate Quebec, uh, increasing immigration and the ideology of multiculturalism. It's, it's interesting that um, when, and this has been you know, the 1993 election and prior to that with the Reform Party, it soon became something that the Reform Party dropped when the reaction in the country was that this is not Canada. And it's interesting that later on when the Reform Party mutated and became the Conservative Party that uh, Prime Minister uh, Harper and Jason Kenney, the current Premier of uh, Alberta, um, embraced multiculturalism, did not reject it. In, 19, in 2015, uh, Prime Minister Harper insists that Muslim women show their face at citizenship ceremonies. Uh, this woman asserted her charter rights at the, I think it was the appellate court in Ontario, was said that if she wants to show her face, she could show it to another woman if that's what she wants to do. And she did that. Um, she voted the 2015 election. We don't know how she voted, but we may know how she didn't vote or for whom she didn't vote. <laughs> Kelly Leach in 2016, co-author of the Barbaric Cultural Practices Stitch Line, together with Chris Alexander, uh, launched her uh, bid for the Conservative Party leadership. Uh, Kelly Leach said, if you are tired of feeling like we can't discuss what our Canadian values are, then please come and help me fight uh, uh, back by making a donation. She got 6% of the vote on the first ballot at the Conservative Convention. More recently, of course, we've seen Bill 21, uh, the new uh, coalition, Avenir Quebec. And of course, this is, it, it's essentially uh, saying you can't have religious garb if you're going to be in a position of authority like a policeman or a, a judge or in a classroom. And uh, it's, while it does include things like kippahs and kirpans and turbans and so on, which means that Jagmeet Singh, after he becomes Prime Minister and then wants to become a public school teacher in Quebec, he will have to change his clothing. Uh, and uh, But it's mainly obviously aimed at uh, women in Quebec who are the few women who are wearing hijabs or niqabs. And it's going to be challenged in the courts and it'll be interesting to see if it does survive. It is very popular in Quebec. So we're not immune from xenophobia. Um, what is it that protects us from the populist tsunami? Well, first of all, 
Um, there are a lot of immigrants in our country. 20% immigrants, 20%, another 20% of their children. They're concentrated in our cities. Uh, I tell this to my, my, my American friends. First of all, I tell them the population of Toronto. Greater Toronto, Toronto is 5 million. That they find hard to believe. That in 15 years, it's going to be 10 million in the greater Toronto area. Um, Toronto was 50% <coughs> born. Uh, another 30% are their kids. I would think an anti-immigrant stance is not going to win you many seats in Toronto. <laughs> uh, Vancouver, 70% first or second generation. Calgary, Hamilton, Edmonton. Uh, London, you're at 42%. So at least two in five of our 12 largest cities are foreign born or their kids. The vast majority, although this is declining somewhat lately, maybe because the citizenship test is getting more difficult for people to pass, uh, but as of uh, 2016, 85% uh, of immigrants become citizens. That's an astounding uh, proportion of people. You're coming here, you know, you get a job, you get your kids in school, um, and the sense then is, is that, and again, this is unlike the United States, where citizenship is not as valued by immigrants, maybe because their sense is it's not going to make any difference to them anyway. But here, people think that they should become citizens, and so part of being a successful Canadian is not just getting that job and putting your kids in public school, it is actually getting your citizenship. And the percent who have citizenship after the period of time that they have to be in the country uh, working age immigrants with at least 10 years experience and Canada ranks number one in terms of immigrants to a country getting their citizenship. Quite a bit ahead of, of, of the United States. Okay, this is, uh, this is hot off the presses. Um, Canadians elected 47 foreign born members of Parliament a month ago. Okay, yeah, if you come to the country, you get a job, kids at school, you know, get your citizenship, you join a political party, or you vote, then you join a political party, uh, then you get nominated, and then you get elected. No other country in the world has this experience. We have the same proportion of people in our federal legislature than are in the population eligible to vote. It's, it's an incredible uh, uh, statistic. And the other incredible thing about it is that they're in all political parties except one. Sadly, uh, the bloc has become kind of uh, chauvinistic. Um, there once was a member of the bloc who was foreign born in 2011. And I really love that statistic because I said only in Canada would an immigrant come and join a party that wants to destroy the country <laughs> and that we would brag about it. <laughs> um, so you've got 36 liberals, eight, eight conservatives. It's the only conservative party I can think in any country that doesn't want to send all immigrants home. These are people who want to get immigrants to join their party. And they actually have a reasonable chance at it because a lot of immigrants have kind of conservative, family-oriented type of values, more religious values that, that liberals or the conservatives uh, think would appeal. And it's true, they elect eight uh, members of, uh, of their, uh, uh, eight members of, of the conservative caucus are foreign born. Uh, the New Democrats used to have a lot more. Uh, they uh, only have two of their caucus none in the block, and, uh, and one-third of the, the Green Party is foreign born. Her English is coming along beautifully. Actually, it's a lady who has just resigned or retired as leader of the party. She's from the United States. There was a time when 100% of that party was foreign born, and we're really bragging about that one, you know, how open and inclusive we were. 
So this is, this is pretty remarkable stuff. In, in 2011, we had 42, and then in 2015, we had 46, and now we're up to 49, so we're not going back. Um, I have more data on this, because I also have numbers on the number of people in each party who were um, nominated, who, who had the nomination but didn't necessarily win the election. So there's a heck of a lot more who were nominated, put in writings, and it's quite clear, too, we didn't just put the foreign-born in writings that the parties couldn't win. They put people into writings where they could win and, and be in federal parliament. So this, this is something that ought to make us feel very good. And of course, these people in federal, and they come from all over the world, I, I stats on that, um, from Africa. Well, our Minister of, <laughs> our Minister of Immigration comes from Somalia. Uh, I don't know that you'll get it. Have they appointed the cabinet yet? I guess we haven't seen that, so I don't know whether he'll keep his job in that uh, post. Our defense minister from India with a turban on. I, I just couldn't, I was imagining him attending a NATO meeting. And they were saying, mm, how did you get past immigration? <laughs> um, so that it is something, and, and the same was true too in the, in the uh, conservative government of Mr. Harper, but obviously a more high profile uh, a more uh, higher profile in, in the Liberal government. Oh, and there they are. Here, here are some of those uh, more and more. And actually, I remember it. Remember the Mountie? Like this is 19, what year? 80 maybe? 90. Yeah, I think it was 1990. It was the government of Mr. Mulroney. And, and a Mountie wanted to wear his turban. And then, of course, the joke at that time was is that, well, okay, we'll let him wear his turban as long as all Mounties don't have to wear turbans. <laughs> so we, you know, this is, <laughs> they'd have to give up their stats. But, so, that, and that's an indication that we've been doing reasonable accommodation for a fair amount of time. Now, there's the ultimate, of course, in integration is when people actually not just have friends from another group outside the Rome, <laughs> but they actually get married. And these, this comes from 2011. We have a small proportion of mixed race couples, but among minority groups, 79% of Japanese Canadians have married outside the group. Now, when I presented this in Japan, which that kind of thing doesn't happen in Japan <laughs> at all, right? They even discriminate against Japanese who go to South America and then come back. Um, they wonder what we put in the water. <laughs> What's going on here? Latin American, 48% married outside the group. Black Canadians, 40%. Compares to about 16% of black Americans who marry outside the group. 40% in Canada. Filipino. Large groups we have here are South Asians, right? India, Sri Lanka, and uh, Pakistan. 13%, and Chinese Canadians, 19%, marrying outside the group. It increases with education. So as you walk around this campus, you're seeing some very interesting things taking place and about to take place. And there are going to be an increasing number. And it is, now this is a dreamy thought that the human beings in Canada, in this Petri dish, could actually evolve from xenophobia to tolerance, to xenophilia. And I might write a book called Xenophilia, if somebody else hasn't already done it. So when it comes to a backlash to globalization and income inequality, Canada is less vulnerable than the US and many other countries. So another reason why people could be upset is that there's a tremendous amount of income inequality, and there certainly is in Canada. But there's less in Canada than there is in many other countries, particularly the United States. Uh, this is a very hard slide to kind of understand, but basically what it is saying is that countries with very little social mobility um, uh, are countries with great inequality, and the countries with less inequality have much more social mobility. A Canadian in the bottom quintile of the income category has twice the likely of moving up another quintile or two in Canada than the United States. If you want the American dream, 
you're going to have to suffer a little bit of snow in the winter. Uh, it is a remarkable, uh, it's, a, it's a remarkable statistic and a social, social, social scientist, uh, economist, Miles Korak is going to be giving a lecture in Toronto at our invitation in the spring and is going to be giving us more information about inequality and social mobility and how Canada is doing <coughs> relatively well, not as well as it could be doing, but it's doing relatively well. We also express pretty robust uh, confidence in our national institutions. This is a research we do, as, as, or the Gallup does. Uh, this is a percentage of Canadians who feel that they have confidence in their national government, about six in 10, really no matter who is in power, liberal or conservative, uh, compared to the average of the other OECD countries. These are the rich countries in the world, the United States and France and Germany and so on. So we've got a pretty healthy belief that we have confidence in the national government. Uh, confidence in our educational system, about 7 in 10, is pretty high. Our public education system is an unheralded national treasure. Part, part of the reason it's unheralded is that it's a provincial jurisdiction, so when we say what makes Canada great, they don't automatically think of public education. But it, in fact, is the great integrator and the great escalator. It's, uh, I guess, another book to be written about just how important public education system. We still have 93% of people in public education. Uh, we have very high quality across the country because of equalization. So it's the difference between, let's say, Newfoundland and the rich province like Ontario or Alberta on spending on education is about plus or minus 10%. The difference between Mississippi and Massachusetts is a difference between a third world country and a first world country. You look at a place like Chicago, you better live in the right neighborhood if you're going to send your kid to a public school because there are areas where the public school is not going to give your kid a, an education and compare that to Toronto or London and so on. So it's, a, it's, it's, it's a, an unheralded and an extremely important uh, role it has in social mobility and the integration of, uh, of uh, immigrants, refugees and others. Uh, confidence in our financial institutions, those banks in Toronto that we love to hate, or probably hate to love, no, love to hate, I think. Um, but there is great confidence in our, our financial system. You can see 77% have support for that. We saw the great financial meltdown in 2008. It didn't happen in Canada. Um, so could it still happen here in Canada? I think everything happens in Canada. Um, the question is, will we get a cold or will we get pneumonia? Everything happens here, which means that whenever I go into debates, I always lose because the person who disagrees with me has an anecdote and all I've got is data. So I'm at a tremendous disadvantage. Uh, and by the way, data is not <laughs> the plural of anecdote. <laughs> So I think part of the, the reason is that we have not been devastated by international trade. We voted for free trade in 1988 and NAFTA in 1993. Uh, China came into the World Trade Organization in 2001. Um, our economy was not devastated. There were changes. And the Nectar factory in Kitchener is no longer making furniture. It's got a bunch of kids in uh, in high-tech startups. We've managed to adapt. Why we managed to adapt? Because we don't live in a Darwinist country, because governments matter here. And governments can deploy resources. Governments can fund colleges like Fanshawe, and universities like Western, and hospitals like the great hospitals in the city. And that has led then to the fact that the devastation of and especially for the Americans with the WTO uh, and all those jobs migrating from Il uh, Indiana to China didn't happen here. And so we don't have that sense of devastation. We don't have the uh, impact like the Rust Belt. And you don't have to go too far south here to see the impact that it's had. And we have a government here that makes decisions to try to retrain people and so on. We have, one of, we have good, mediocre health care. 
but it's for everybody. Nobody goes bankrupt in Canada for their health care expenses. You do have to wait a while to get your hip replacement and your knee replacement. My friends at the tennis club are discovering this. But you don't, if you have any crisis, they're going to put a band-aid on that bleeding finger pretty quick. Uh, if you go bankrupt from health costs, it's probably because you went to the States to get a miracle cure. God bless you. Um, so health care and strong social programs, good public education, as I said, less income and wealth inequality than in, uh, in uh, many countries of Europe and the United States, and lots of evidence that immigrants and refugees are successfully integrating into the economy, into, our, into the education. They do well on PISA tests. Uh, it's the program of international student assessment measures 15-year-olds in all the OECD countries. Second generation immigrants in Canada outperform second generation immigrants in every other country. They're cl Australia's close, but other countries, uh, our, our second generation is outperforming all of these other countries, and they're outperforming children whose parents have been here for three generations or more, which is something for those of us who've been here three generations or more like reflect upon. So, and then, of course, they're integrating as citizens. They're becoming citizens, and they're getting elected to our national legislature, and they become icons of what you can do when you come to Canada. So, yes, it'll happen here, um, but uh, we'll survive. Thank you.